Why is everyone fleeing the faith? Last week, we talked about in our segment one with Bishop Lloyd Nisek. This week, we're back with Bishop Lloyd Nisek, and we're going to find out why everyone is leaving the faith and dive into scriptures and the gospel and learn about faith, our trust in Jesus Christ. Join us over these next 25 minutes in our campus ministry segment brought to you by the Christian Campus House. I'm your host, Nate Cooper. This message is part of the Christian Campus House on the Missouri State University campus. CCH is a ministry to encourage students in a life-changing relationship with God. The message is presented by the CCH director, Nate Cooper. For more information, go to www.morecch.com. This is your Christian Campus House campus ministry segment as we dive in talking about the different generations, uh, talking on those who are currently in college and how we can really reach out to those in faith. It's all about how what we can do to make the difference for those lives of tomorrow because they are going to be the future generations of the businessmen and women, but also the church and how the church is uh, making uh, different transitions in society today. Are they good? Are they bad? Uh, what are we talking with on the, the roles of individuals and how we can actually influence their lives? Are they getting the biblical sound teaching that they should be getting at this point in time, or is it not the way it should be? And we have been speaking with last week, uh, Bishop Lloyd and sect of the Church of Water of Life Community Church in California. And we got into the conversation on the fact of why many are fleeing the faith at the ages of 18 to 24, because a survey comes across one in four adults in that age range, they are not currently affiliated with any religion. And so the question we started off with last week was why is everyone fleeing the faith? And we'll introduce you this week once again with that same question, the same kind of concept. Uh, Bishop uh, Lloyd Nasek came out with his book. It's the, uh, you can get your hands on that copy at Barnes and Noble and many other places. It's Christianity, the end of spiritual confusion. Bishop, it's good having you on again this week. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. I'm glad. So you're currently with the Church Water of Life in California? Correct. Is this your first book or just on one of many? Well, this is the first book, which is be one of many to come, but this is the foundational that sets the tone for what slides next. We've been talking on the subject of why is everyone fleeing the faith? Could you uh, briefly explain what we talked about last week? Why is everyone fleeing the faith, Bishop? Well, first of all, it's clear to them, this category of uh, individuals, that they're not seeing the power of God manifesting in the lives of believers. Like they hear the gospel stands to deliver on that. And the reason is that the gospel message is being mixed in with the Old Testament writings, which the Bible even by the person of Jesus Christ, forbids that from uh, being done. In Luke chapter 5, he says, no one takes a piece of a new garment and attaches it with the old, very clearly. He says, if you do this, the, the new will not match the old, and there shall be a spillage. The new wine cannot be put in old wine skins, but in new wine skins, and the two are preserved. Therefore, the power of God, which he himself, Jesus, speaking as God, as the Son of God, says, I'm giving you this message, but it's not mine, it's from my Father who sent me. And he spoke the opposite of the Old Testament in Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, and also in Luke. So we have to understand why Jesus made that stipulation. So when the young one sees that, Scandals erupts in churches by the biggest of all. I mean, you heard one with Bishop Eddie Long and many others who have been caught up, uh, Ted Haggard and many others, uh, caught up in this scandalous you know, situation. What happened to them? What happened to the Holy Spirit? They've been preaching for years. So what happened now? So you see that there's a problem. The power of God is not moving in the church world arena like it should be. So young children seeing this and seeing the scandal they see on television, they're like, wait a minute, something is, there's something, something is going wrong here. And they, they, they now kind of like, you know, they don't know what to do anymore. Are we quenching the spirit in our services, Bishop? Yes, we are. When we mix the two together, see, the, the functionality of the Old Testament and the New Testament needs to be fully understood. And then once we get that right, we obey the words of Jesus. 
if God is not talking to us any longer by the prophets of old, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, but by His Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we need to listen to the Son of God speak to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and on and on with the writings of Paul and the others in the New Testament. Many of the churches and individuals will take the Old Testament and use some scriptures and apply it to what current situations they're going through. It, it all depends on the purpose. You see, if we, let's say, for example, we get into the story of Joseph, and this is a type of Christ, and the message of Joseph going through what he went through, and in Egypt and being sold by the brothers to the Ishmaelites and on and on, and then he emerged to become the prime minister in Egypt, and therefore he's a type of Christ. Well, that is nice. However, what there uh, in, in that story talks about Jesus Christ who came and lived amongst the Israelites for 33 and a half years. How is Moses, Joseph, was Joseph able to touch a leper and get the leper healed? Was Joseph able to speak and cast out demons from someone whom he encountered in the temple like Jesus did? No, that did not happen. So it's all about the, 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 the uh, earthly things, you know, the, 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 the eat, the bread, and the, and, the, and the food, and the body, and the soul. Not about the spirit. The difference is that the gospel was here, uh, sent, Jesus came here to tackle the last frontier of human nature the spirit nature of mankind. See, we are spirit beings. We're not just body and soul. We have a spirit. But it's been hijacked since the fall of man. He's been kept in bondage. So the gospel is here to uh, awaken the spirit of man in righteousness. Not in sin, but in righteousness. So that he, that spirit of God in us, that makes us just like God, make, makes us to be like God. No more types and shadow. But the real thing, we want the real thing. Children want the real thing. They want the real deal, a real dad, a real mom. A foster father is nice. A foster mom is nice. But where is my dad that gave birth to me? Where is my mom that gave That is what you find going on in this day and age. And so the real thing is the gospel that awakens the human spirit to face the challenges of today. Because hell is not joking. The Bible says, therefore, in First Peter 5, that the devil roams about like a lion seeking whom to devour. That's why we're having problems all around us. What is there? Has God left us to, to be weak and com completely uh, uh, irresponsible or completely not responding to these matters? No, He hasn't. He sent His Son. And the words that His Son came with, the gospel message, which is not to be mixed with the old, is the, the, the antidote that now would allow you to understand who you are and mount up with power to rebuke the enemy, and he flees from you. Bishop Lloyd Nasek here joining us for the Christianity, the end of spiritual confusion. When you compare the Old Testament with the New Testament, the Old Prophecy with the New Prophecy, the uh, Old Covenant with the New Covenant, when Jesus came, did he take a radical approach in uh, speaking to the disciples, but also to those around him, that it would change the face of of a new religion because Christianity was not here in existence uh, before Jesus came. W what would you have to say about the fact that Jesus took a radical approach? Is that true, Bishop? Yes, it's true, very true, because how true it is, we go way back into the days of Jeremiah. In the days of Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 31 from verses 31 to 34, it was announced as a prophecy, as an ancient prophecy to those in Israel while they were yet in the law of Moses. God spoke through him to inform the people that he will make a new covenant, and it will not be in the way that he led them out of the land of Egypt. You see, on that note, everybody in Israel became somewhat, well, we don't see it yet until so when the Messiah came, that's why Jesus then went straight up. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, he picked up the book uh, of Isaiah and read, he said, this day, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has now anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I've been, I've been sent to mend the broken heart, uh, recovery of sight to the blind, and proclaim liberty to the captives. And when he did all that, he said, This day, at your hearing, me read this, these words are fulfilled. So he was very straight up about get on to business, 
let's tackle this last frontier, get mankind to wake up from the slumber and the gullibleness and naivety of life and living, and know that he has power over Satan. <laughs> So when you just look into the scripture, you know that between the Old and New Testaments, there's lots of symb- symbolism, lots of things that you can take literally and figuratively. And But when you look at Jesus' approach, the approach that Jesus took with the Jews, with the Gentiles, as he commissioned Paul to go do, and the other disciples was to preach the word to all nations of all tribes. Yeah, he was direct. Absolutely. Jesus used parables to deal with some of the subject matters of that day in uh, trying to draw the analogies from the common things of their daily living, as you would. And so Paul came and made it, in fact, he was very direct in talking to the church in Galatia and said to them, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you to have turned away from the very message I delivered to you? Because if you read further in the book of Acts, there was a time when the apostle Paul, uh, Peter and many others would come from Jerusalem, and they would try to, try to you know, uh, inject circumcision as a righteous order for one to be saved. And Paul heard this and confronted Peter face to face. So you cannot do this. He would then play games by uh, eating with the, you know, the Gentiles when the Jews are not around. But when the Jews would come, he would therefore uh, segregate himself from the, Jewish, uh, uh, from the Gentile body and be with the Jewish brethren from Jerusalem. That, that was hypocrisy, as far as Paul was concerned. So you see, this problem has always been swimming around in Christianity in the early formative stages. But now it's time to fix it, and let's now stop all of these things and follow what Jesus says, so we can get the very benefit of the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. We don't have to work it out. God does it. We just have to obey Him by believing. Just believe. We all go through times of struggle, grief, and tragedy. I, I mean, that's yes. given. Uh, death is inevitable. We will face death sooner or later of our physical body. But when is the time that we should turn to faith? Is it in the, these times? You are to have faith every single day. Faith is uh, something that you build on every blessed day. That way, the will of God is perfected in your life. Your faith is perfected in your life. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we live in an evil and perverse generation. The spirit that is in the world is an evil spirit. And you see all kinds of mayhem, you know, terrorism, uh, attacks of any kind, betrayal, you know, vandalism, killings, death, all manner of things. Therefore, you need the counter offer, which is from the kingdom of God. The whole purpose of the kingdom of God is to give us a new perspective of living, a new way of following God, whereby... We don't really have to, oh, just be inundated or say these things as if they are insurmountable. It is a question of what is the ultimate uh, focus that one ought to have that now enables one to uh, sail through these evil terrain called life on earth. The Word of God takes us, he said, Paul said this, if only in this life do we have hope then we, of all men, are most miserable. Meaning that there is, in this world, the world must continue the way it's going on. Jesus said there will be chaos, wars, rumors of wars, kingdom fighting against kingdom. But the only thing that would take us beyond is the gospel. Once the gospel of the kingdom is preached, properly preached, then the end comes. So we see an end to this mess, because the world is going to be blown away by God himself. This is in Second Peter. He's going to make a new world happen by destroying this one. When once that happens, the church is, is going to go up, by the way, and then we come back down and then kind of live in a new world as Jesus will rule for a thousand years. That's the hope of Christianity. It's something that when we look at what Christianity is about, it's about reaching out to those souls who are lost, those who are not of the faith. Why are people not coming to the faith when it offers what it offers? Coming to faith is to come to Jesus Christ. He is the author and finisher of faith. That's what the Bible declares. The law is not of faith. So when we come to Christianity with the mindset of the law of Moses, there is the problem right there. As you uh, clearly observe, many come in there and say, well, I'm not into this thing. What is it that they're not into? They're not into the religious practices 
that is now currently carrying on or going on in the churches. Uh, the tithing and the, all these other things become center, the most primary focus than the actual gospel. The gospel is really a message. And we need to just be in line to receive. And in receiving, we are therefore moving and walking in the righteousness of God. It's simply belief. Coming to God requires a sacrifice. And when we look at the sacrifice, we, we read about it, we've heard about it, that Jesus was our ultimate sacrifice. He is the one who died on the cross. Uh, as yes. you're reading, you know, one of the most famous scriptures that everyone knows, John 3, 16, that some people often overlook is in Galatians. Is it talking in uh, chapter four uh, about how Christ freed us from sin? There are no longer the yearly sacrifices that you hear in the Old Testament, yes. but there was a change and sacrifices. Yes. And so the new law, it's a, known as a single sacrifice that has freed us from sin. And so Jesus was the one who fulfilled that law. And yes. we put our trust in Jesus and we are then having a life transformation. Yes. Bishop, but, your book here, Christianity, The End of Spiritual Confusion. So there's just been a big mess of things that we've added on to how to get to, to Jesus on the cross at Calvary. We've added on to that. Would you? Would that, would that be a fair statement? Yes, we do. We have made a mess of things uh, because it's very clear that uh, this is, you know, let me give an analogy, uh, Ned, uh, and for the audience listening in, because this is very crucial. When you board an airplane at the airport of your state or county, wherever you're flying from to go where you're going, your destination, the pilot and the crew would taxi the airline from the dock all the way to the runway, and on that runway they wait. And as they're waiting, there is now a communication that happens between the pilot and the tower that is going to clear the flight to take off. And in that, in that moment, something happens. There is a frequency for communication between that pilot and the tower alone for that particular airline. And there is no other way that the pilot, while the plane is on, on air, is going to reach the tower safe for that new frequency that they've given that pilot. So if he kind of like dial off from that frequency line that they give, that they give him or her as a pilot, he, will not, he or she will not be able to contact the tower again. So this is the crucial part of that Christian faith. Jesus is, as you said, he is that communication. He is the way, according to what he said in John 14, 17, 17 and 8. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. So put that in context. That analogy of the pilot and the tower and the frequency alone that they can do, the two sides can communicate at all times while the flight is on, on, on the air, going to where it's going, this is what happens. Once we're not on that frequency of Christ Jesus and add things to it or subtract things from it and we're not on him fully, we lose. And this is the problem. So we need to get back on the frequency of clear communication with God. That's Jesus Christ. And like I said earlier, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all of the writings of Paul and the others to the book of Revelation, that's where you build that relationship that now positions you to be amongst those who are going to make the rapture. That is the whole point now. When you look at just our being here on earth, we're speaking with uh, Bishop Lloyd Nasek, who is with the Water of Life Community Church in California. He also is the author of his new book, Christianity, The End of Spiritual Confusion. And we'll be giving you the opportunity in just a couple minutes of where you can purchase that book and maybe get a chance to get in contact with uh, Bishop Lloyd on what he is doing and why he wrote this book and it being driven by the spirit, uh, being able to be uh, a New Testament of what our focus is on, why we are looking at the New Testament and what the profound statement is within it and why we are to follow what God wants us to do, how we are uh, now... Uh, you know, we are freed from that sin. We are free from those things in the past because Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. He came in and took that place. And when you look at the, the fact that when Paul goes even into um, talking about when Jesus was dead on the cross, he, you know, he put to death on the cross. He put that there, that the laws were changed when Christ died on the cross at Calvary. And it goes on into 
uh, to Hebrews. It's the death of the one who made it. And, you know, it's the covenant that is only valid by, by the, the men who are dead. And, and, and I wish I could just give you that full tie, the, the full scripture there. But it's talking about how when Moses in the Old Testament would do sacrifices with blood. Yes. And yes, then, that's Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. That's yes, where that is from. Yes, that's, yes. That's, and then it goes into how Christ's death is on the cross. Um, you know, Christ was that new sacrifice, the shedding of the blood, and that's where it begins. Yes. yes. To me, I think that's what, I mean, your, your book, clearly, it seems like it's going to be a great read, and I cannot wait to get my hands on a copy of it. I and appreciate that. I would love for, you know, our listeners out there to get their chances to uh, get a hold of one. Uh, today, we're running out of time, and I'm going to give you the last uh, opportunity to speak what you'd like to speak. Um, you've got a couple minutes. Uh, just, I pray that God will just uh, pour into you, and, and uh, you can speak to our listeners. Any last words of wisdom? Yes. Um, I love you with the love of Christ. All the listeners to Ned Cooper's uh, show here in the city of West Bend, Missouri there. I am very, very, very touched by this particular ministry of uh, this gentleman here. Uh, his uh, passion for Christ, his passion for uh, the, the lost is, is well noted in heaven. And therefore, God made it possible for he and I to connect and for me to be on this show. This is the time now for everyone to sort of take a look and ask yourself this question. How am I a Christian? How is my Christianity stacking up with that which Jesus laid down? If you compare your life walk and your work and your doings and your behavior, particularly your behaviors, if they don't match that which Jesus says, are you able to forgive someone when someone does you wrong? Are you, are you finding it difficult to forgive? There is your, should I say, the indicator of your Christian faith. If it's a problem for you to forgive your father, your mother, your cousin, your friend, your sister, or whoever does you wrong, your neighbor, then you need to be on your knees immediately and get to the gospel. Because it is from the gospel, the words of Jesus are spirit and life. Read them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every day, one chapter a day. These words would now bring in to you, just like you eat your food, uh, milk, and cereal in the morning, and they turn into blood uh, or flesh and bones in you. Bananas give you potassium. The gospel brings you the spirit of God. That's what Jesus said that in John 6, 63. The words I speak, their spirit and life. The gospel is not what you're getting today in the churches. The words, what you're having is a mixed up stuff. You cannot mix the gospel with the Old Testament and get the gospel. It's wrong. Paul said very clearly in Galatians 1, 8 and 9, that if I, Paul, or another angel comes from heaven to preach another gospel, and which is not the one that I've, I've preached to you from Jesus Christ, let he or she be accursed. It is so serious because Paul discovered that it's important to stay plugged into Christ Jesus. So I believe that this uh, discussion here will help to propel all of us forward. You know, we pray every day. You can join up with me on Twitter at Lloyd Nisek or uh, my website at the Bishop Lloyd dot webs dot com. And let's have a discussion further. The church, if it's going to continue to grow and fulfill the great commission of making disciples of all nations, it's going to have to change the way it's going about what we are trying to do to reach that next generation. Without a doubt, we are here to find that same thing, the thing that we all can relate to, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that within the churches, I pray that within the individuals, that in the pastors who are leading this next generation and the generations to come, that we can accomplish these goals, these things in life of raising them up, discipling them and giving them the understanding of what Christianity is truly about. Bishop Lloyd Nasect, the author of Christianity, the end of spiritual confusion. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you for your words of wisdom. And I pray that God will be with you in your ministry. And I'm so glad we got a chance to connect. Thank you, Ned. It's been a pleasure. Why is everyone fleeing the faith? If you all want to know more, then you can get more. It's Christianity, the end of spiritual confusion. Books are available. You can go to Bishop's website. What is that website? One more time, Bishop Lloyd. Uh, Bishoployd.webs.com. Or you can go to all bookstores dot com and then put in the title or by the author's name Lloyd 
and it's like NSEK, and it will show, and then hit compare prices. You will see all of the stores, wherever you are in the country, which store is closest to you to go and make a purchase. Thank you, and uh, may God be with you in, in your future days ahead. And you too, Ned. Thank you for having me. You bet. The further we reach out, the closer we all become. This is your Christian Campus House Campus Ministry segment. This message is part of the Christian Campus House on the Missouri State University campus. CCH is a ministry to encourage students in a life-changing relationship with God. The message is presented by the CCH director, Nate Cooper. For more information, go to www.morecch.com.